Okay, we've got uh, Brett Hart on the line right now. Let's go to uh, Calgary, Canada. Brett, how are you doing today? I'm doing okay, Dave. How are you? I'm doing really good. We've also got uh, Brian Alvarez on the line. Brian, say hi to say hi to Brett. Hey, how's it going? How are you doing, Brian? Um, I guess the first thing that we should bring up and that everyone's curious is uh, what's basically your injury status? I know that you uh, you went to the doctors, uh, a couple of doctors probably last week, and, and what have you learned and what's the prognosis? Well, I've, uh, right now I'm out till at least July. But, but, but there's no change in that. They've uh, ruled out any kind of wrestling at all till then. And there's no real change in that for right now, it's just, I just sort of take it one day at a time. They wait to see. You know, so far they've been really accurate, and I've learned. The one thing I've learned through this whole thing is I've lost, kind of lost that ability to sort of diagnose myself. You know, I keep, kept trying to do that early and kept thinking that it wasn't that serious, that I was actually, you know, better than I thought. And now I realize after, you know, having been through it, that I'm a lot like an Eric Lindros. I really just didn't know what I was doing. And I was hurt, I think, a lot worse than anyone uh, understood, including me. So uh, as far as things that I've done, like I've had brain scan, balance tests, and all kinds of stuff, but there's no real change in the actual confession. I still have a little bit of trouble with my speech, but not too much. Uh, my recall is much better, but, it, you know, you can just tell being me that I'm still a little off. Um and your, this your short-term memory, like I get a headache from flash, flash bulbs or lights, or it can even be a loud sound or slam doors, and, and you end up you don't notice it at first. You know, even if you're driving the traffic and you're kind of whipping your head around and stuff like that, you don't notice it at first until a few, maybe an hour or so later, that you got a huge migraine headache. So you just, you know, you may appear fine or look fine, but you're, you know, you're really messed up, and it just, it's just. It's been the most frustrating and most um, worrisome injury I think I've ever had. So, hope that well, this, is, a this, bit. this is pretty much the first potential career-ending injury you had, right? Mm, yeah, yeah. None of them were career-ending. Mm-hmm. And again, people, you know, they, they, I think they underestimate uh, concussions. Like, you know, I, I know for a fact that. Uh, you know, there's, there's clearly no way right now under any circumstance that I could wrestle or or do anything close to it. It's, it's that bad. And it, it has been a scary injury. I've had people, you know, interpret things their own way. I've had you know, people go, well, what's he doing at a hockey game? Well, a hockey game doesn't bother me. I can, I can focus on things. I can, my concentration is okay, but it does tend to cause, uh, you know, you get a headache from, you know, worrying about something or concentrating too hard on something. You know, if I relax, and I'm really totally relaxed, uh, you know, I can almost feel like I don't have a concussion at all. But it's, you know, unfortunately, for the last few months, it's been really very hard to relax. And it's been really hard for me to, you know, because, of course, it was much worse. It gets a little bit better all the time. So you're really out of whack with yourself. You, you, You have to just step back. Quit trying to diagnose yourself. I haven't lifted the weight. I can't work out. Uh, I can't do any exercise. I can't. I even had where I was uh, bent over time with my shoe as an example, and I kind of got the knot. And I didn't think much of it. I just kind of fiddled around with it. I did it. By the time I got up, I, I felt like I was going to pass out or fall down. Or you just get so lightheaded. And those are all things that I think can happen just about anybody. You know, everyone kind of gets up too fast sometimes, and you wonder where you draw the line between sort of overreacting and getting paranoid. But the concussion is something you, when you want to sort of live through what I've lived through, you really realize you're, I've been in a funk for quite a few months, and it's been pretty scary. Do you, do you think pretty much that you got it when, uh, when you got the kick from Goldberg, or do you think you may have come in uh, and, and re-injured at that point, or maybe maybe because, you know, you had a couple of matches afterwards where you took some headshots that maybe, I mean, could it have been a dual concussion, or do you attribute yeah, it all the back to one blow? It's about seven blows. Seven, he thought it was six or seven different blows. But I'd say um, I took at least three. In watching my match back with Bill Goldberg and Starcade, I took three in the match with Bill. Uh, really severe headshots that... Uh, you know, you kind of brush them off and just take them as part of the job. And I'm not saying that to all three of them were, were Bill's fault either. I, I, um, you know, the kick.
kick was one, though, that was the worst. That was the one that tore a muscle in the back of my head. I've actually got a torn muscle in, in my neck that I guess is um, going to bother me for a long time. It'll never, it'll never be the same. It's about, you can almost stick your thumb through the, there's like a small hole in the back of my neck now. So that's, he kicked my head so hard, and I don't think he was looking where he was kicking. And it's just another one of those moves that people do today that, that they don't uh, put a lot of thought into the consequence of it. But that kick in itself has certainly cost me a great deal of money, and it certainly uh, uh, caused me a lot of grief uh, physically because I'd say he almost kicked my head off my shoulders, and he, he his eyes are nowhere, they're not even looking at his feet. So, I mean, I went in open-minded enough, and, you know, I, I just I just got... Just got, I got kicked like a guy would get kicked by a horse, and it, it's been a, it was almost like an uppercut with his leg if you watch it, and that was the worst one of the three. That one I think put me in a funk. Like in a, that was in the fog. I was in the fog ever since, and I think I took you know I took a, in my match with uh, Terry Funk for example. Uh, he dumped me out of a basket or a, some kind of wheeled uh, container. In that hardcore match, and I hit my head right on the right, my back of my head, right where the worst place I could hit it, exactly where I got kicked. And I think that was another big blow to my head. As was the last match I worked with uh, Kevin Nash, and Sid came out. Uh, he choke slammed me, which was the, that's when I saw stars for the first time, and I think that's where my speech was affected. And then he power bombed me after that, and that was me. <laughs> that was. Uh, at this point, hopefully, isn't the uh, it wasn't the last move ever done on me because it, it's it's uh, all both those two. And I, Sid was fine; it wasn't anything he did. It was just I shouldn't have been in there. I had a concussion, and I, sh- I should have. Uh, it just got steadily got worse, and it's a shame because I, I see what the what happened with Eric Lindroth, and I'm reading about it. He's he's aware that he has a concussion, but he's not you know doing anything about it. And I really felt for that three weeks or maybe even four weeks that I had the concussion. Um, you know, you could have talked me into walking across the way into traffic, and I would have done it. You know, it was like, I just was sort of blasé, and I didn't really think everything through. And, you know, in particular, there was that accident, and, and, well, not accident, but potential accident I could have had in Salisbury, Maryland, when uh, they asked me to drive a truck, or not a truck, a car out of the back ramp of the building with Bill Goldberg chasing me. That's where he punched his hand through the window. Right, Bill right. Goldberg died. Uh, um, Brett, we were uh, talking about um, your your injury and and things like that. You know, it's some Jeff Merrick was on the show um, actually right after you did the off the record thing, um, and he said that they wanted to ask a question and basically ran out of time. And that was with WCW um, cutting pay of people if they're out for say whatever it was thirty days and they start cut the pay. He felt, and they wanted to ask you, if that would obviously encourage guys to come back sooner than they should, which could lead to, you know, whether it be painkillers to mask injuries that haven't fully healed or, you know, things of that nature. I mean, what are, what are your thoughts as far as, you know, the cutting pay uh, of, uh, if you suffer an injury on the job, you know, 30 days after the injury? Yeah, I think that that whole thing is totally bogus. Uh, I, I was never aware of the circumstances of that. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I didn't do anything wrong, and I've been, uh, you know, I know the injury. This injury has been, you know, hasn't been helpful to the, uh, the WCW. But I think, you know, when they send me in the ring with somebody, you know, they, and and especially someone like Bill Goldberg, who's the, you know, you like to think they're building the franchise around. And, you go in there doing your everything possible you can to, you know, to make this the, the best match uh, possible. And then you get hurt in the line of duty. I, I don't think it's uh, uh, unrealistic for you to openly, clearly expect the, the, the company to take care of you and and, uh, and protect you from, from but this, you know, it's just it's not fair. You know, I don't think that's how it works in, in any other sport. And, you know, I think it's high time that... Uh, you know, they treated wrestlers the same way they treat uh, any other baseball players and anybody else that gets injured in this kind of situation. I, I don't know. I just doesn't seem fair to me. And I, I know that the WCW, you know, has taken care of and protected uh, certain wrestlers for during the course of an injury. And, uh, you know, I think it's different if I got hurt on a motorcycle or something like that. 
but this is a, clearly a situation where I got hurt in the line of duty. So painkillers and all that, I mean, if I was in a really dire straits, like I could, certainly was years ago, uh, I would be forced to go in the ring at uh, at my own medical risk. And uh, I think that goes right back to my circus animals argument from a long time ago. Now, um, one of the things, this, is, this, this brings up two things. Number one is uh, uh, the, the talk of uh, a union that, uh, you know, wrestlers have never had a union, and, and it's such a huge business now that it's kind of almost amazing that they don't. And then the other one is that um, with the this nature of wrestling, uh, the concussions are getting more plentiful, and I, I know you've talked about this in the past, but there's, you know, the new trends in wrestling are making it a lot more dangerous and a lot less skill-oriented than it was yeah, even two, three years ago. Yeah, well, you know, it takes me back to my my not so idle boast about being the best there is and all that. You know, I wrestle twenty twenty two years now, Dave, and you can you can near you sight a wrestler anywhere from Japan to England to anywhere that I ever worked with that I ever physically hurt in a way where he couldn't work the next day. And I'm I think I'm proud of that. And maybe it's maybe my single greatest accomplishment in wrestling is I never injured anybody. The only guy I think I hurt was uh, Bill Goldberg. Funny enough, in a thing. Uh, last year, I hit him across the leg with a chair. But I mean, if you watch the tape, you'll clearly see that Bill moved a couple seconds early. Uh, you know, when I'm in the middle of a swing with a chair and he moves, it's you know unfortunate. And he's still, you know, he's obviously learning a lot uh, as on the fly. And, and, and but I mean, I've never really hurt anybody in my entire career. And now you see guys today, everyone's swinging chairs, and, and uh, the fighting is le less and less in the ring. Uh, you really should have uh, danger pay or or uh, uh, stuntman pay or something because it's not wrestling anymore. It's not wrestling with headlocks and drop kicks and you know to, you clearly know. I think wrestlers, at least I do, I understand the uh, uh, the risk of you know injury in a wrestling ring to a certain degree. But you look at the wrestlers twenty years ago, it was hip toss, arm drag, uh, you know, one tackle, drop down, get it again kind of stuff and. You really didn't get hurt. I mean, you, you know, the, you got hurt in the old days wrestling on bad rings where the, you know, you went down to one knee and it was like, oh, damn, you blew your knee up because there was a hole in the mat or something. But nowadays the rings are pretty good. The, the, the you know, there's just, if guys are just wrestle safer, you know, it's, it's escalated to a point where people are doing moves that, you know, they, and I wouldn't even say this is a very good average, but it's like I can do this, uh, this move eight times out of ten perfect. It's like, well, what about the other two times? You know, and it's become a common. Oh, no one's worrying about those other two times. And I'd say the average is a lot less than uh, that ratio. I mean, it's you know, a lot of times it's hit and miss whether this somebody's doing this move or that move. It's it's you know, he might miss you by six inches, or he'll take your knock all your teeth out, and it's uh, it, your chances are about fifty fifty. If you if you had a way, you know, we were talking about like uh, retirements and things like this, and and. If you had a way to write your finish of your career now, what would that be? I don't know. I really don't know. I'm, uh, it's it's another one of those awful dilemmas for me. I, you know, I envisioned when I, after my brother's accident, about coming back and how I, you know, and I started to kind of see how I would ride into the sunset a little bit. And I thought at least I was going to have fun, that sort of top heel spot and, and, carry the bell for a while and I thought I was going to have great matches with Goldberg. I'd really look forward to working with um, Benoit as the next guy after Goldberg. That seemed to be the uh, plan for me. Uh, I'll be honest because uh, I know I, I sort of kind of found myself criticizing certain aspects of wrestling but in the end I think I end up uh, being pretty hard on Vince Russo in some ways but I actually think Vince Russo did a lot of good at the time and what they had laid out for me in general was I was very happy with the way things were going for me as far as uh, uh, at least it was becoming fun and at least I had some continuity. So I, I don't know if I stop now and look at it. It's really so hard to see because I, you know, I, I, I'm, I don't know. I'd have to have somebody throw some different scenarios at me. If you ask me right today, I don't see one scenario that I would want to jump into. And if I could divide, design my own later on down the line, it's, uh, first of all, I don't have the ability to design my own further on later later on. So it's, you know, I don't have as much of a hand in the creative input, that, you know, with this company as I did with the other. Uh, Vince McMahon, uh, you know, when we 
did work well together. We worked really well together, and he was always really receptive to most of my ideas, and, and we worked really hand-in-hand. Hand. And he, I think, you know, like he's done with everyone else, from uh, Steve Austin and, uh, you know, various guys in the company, you know, we worked really well, and he brought the best out of me, and I and I performed really well for him. Uh, my problems with him came after that. But uh, with the WCW, I haven't had that... Uh, I haven't had that chemistry yet. I'm not saying it wasn't possible because I kind of felt like I was, I was um, on the verge of it before I got hurt. Well, how was your feeling as far as, especially um, a couple weeks back when you went to England and you got that good, really good reception at those shows? Well, it was really emotional because I waited a long time to go back for stars. Uh, same with Germany. I, I have a really s solid fan base. And, you know, it's, it might not be, I don't know if wrestling fans are in that much of an abundance in England, Germany, and whether it's just you take the whole country and you, whatever ones come to the, the venue or the, that area that do come and see you kind of thing. Maybe it's in the overall picture aren't that big of a portion of the worldwide audience. I don't know. But I know that for the ones that are over there, and especially in Germany, but in England also, I, I had a really uh, strong bond with in the sense that when I was not necessarily over as the, the greatest thing in wrestling in America, maybe even a little bit Canada, I was the greatest thing in wrestling for sure in Germany and England, and they loved everything I did, was the black leather jacket, the sunglasses, the whole, you know, it was the greatest experience I ever had as far as, as, far as uh, sort of the pinnacle of my career and had the greatest fans in the world over there, because I mean, like I can remember Wembley Stadium, uh, you know, the soccer chants that they gave me, they, you know, it was just way bigger and louder and different than anywhere else. Same with Germany, you know, where I literally had to, had to fight and claw my way to my rooms in the, in the lobbies of the hotel and stuff. And it was just uh, girls that just uh, just were absolutely in love with you. And I always remember those things. So I, when I went back, I wanted to at least say goodbye. And, uh, and, and I was, you know, I think I was being very honest in the sense that I don't know if I'll ever get back. I always want to go back. If I probably could, I'd love to finish my career and have my last match in Germany just cause out of, uh, you know, gratitude for, for, I think that was the single biggest sort of portion of Hitman fans I ever, you know, combined together was in, in those places. But um, in England, I noticed that when I, when I did my interviews and Germany both, whenever I went out to speak, uh, you know, they listened to every single word I said. I mean, there was not one you could hear a pin drop kind of thing. And it was really nice to actually communicate with a large audience. They were both, both times that I, uh, you know, especially remember, like, the big towns that they ran. Uh, even London, uh, I, I, I got such a strong ovation and such a they, the reception was overwhelming. When I think of when I came back to Atlanta as an example, and again, I'm not bashing them. Uh, American fans at all, but I, I found that there were certain people in the audience in Atlanta that were very uh, hard on uh, hard on me when I was trying to speak about Owen and different things. And I just realized the American audience is so much different than the European one and even the Canadian one. I spoke in Winnipeg a few weeks ago, and it was very much the same as Europe. So my my old stick about Canada and the U.S. still seems to apply, except for it's only a really small portion of the audience that just uh, seems to be very. Uh, Almost kind of, I don't know, just kind of. They don't really give a shit about anything. Yeah. Well, the thing, the thing with the Atlanta thing is that uh, you know, if you watch that tape back, I mean, you got a, a really big ovation leaving, but there were a couple of slow points, and you know, it really only took one or two voices, but those voices were very audible. I mean, it was pretty clear you heard them, and we yeah, all heard. It really them. threw me off. It made me want to just, you know, I don't think people, somebody like a person like that, uh, that maybe you know, found out humorous. I don't think they know how hard it is to go out there and struggle to find the words to and to communicate on that kind of level. And so it's things like that. When I think about going back to, um, you know, Nitro and, uh, and wrestling and all that, you know, I, I think sometimes I'd be better off doing a little video in the back, you know, filming something in the back and letting that air instead of having to put yourself through a, you know, where, where you just, uh, I don't know, it's, it's much harder than people think. Well, especially on, on, on that type of thing. You know, before we go uh, to this to this break, I want to ask you, um, I guess, your thoughts on uh, Davy Boy Smith. Let's <laughs> get right to it, huh? No. Well, I mean, um, just just the whole the whole thing. I mean, the, you know, the whole story's come out. You know, him going back. I mean, I know that you and I talked once about him going back, and it was 
very different than a lot of people, I think. Yeah, and I'm glad for the opportunity to clear the air on it because I don't care that he's working there, and that's been misunderstood right from the beginning. Uh, I don't think Jim Neidhart's working there. I don't say anything about him. And even when Chris Benoit left to go there, you know, I, I left a lot of friends there, and I I don't have any problem where they work or what they do for a living. And Vince is, you know, it's I look at um, you know, my brother's accident. Sometimes it's like a mining accident. It, uh, you know, it happened in the mines, kind of thing. But that doesn't mean everybody else can't work in the mines anymore. They. You know, they have to feed their families and that kind of thing. So I don't have any problem with Davey working for, he worked for whoever he wants to. Uh, my, my objections, Davey have been from him, uh, at the position he's taken, uh, in getting a job in the sense that he's gone way out of his way to, uh, say that he, this is his opinion, I guess, that, 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 that accident with my brother Owen was nobody's fault and nobody's accountable for it. And, uh, you know, the Vince didn't push him. There's another line that he said. I think if you read the whole article that Davey it was in the WWF magazine a few months ago, it was very, uh, you know, very uh, clearly that he's he's on uh, the other side of the tracks as far as my family and Martha and the rest of the people in the lawsuit and how he, he interprets this, uh, this, this horrible accident with my brother Owen. All I'm going to say is that uh, I personally feel that it's definitely somebody's fault and uh, somebody should answer for that. I don't believe, believe it was my brother's fault. Uh, he's never been put in that circumstance. And for Davey to basically uh, posture himself to get a job, especially at that time, you know, here was Davey on Monday or Tuesday morning after the uh, after the tragedy itself. Here was a clearly on TV saying that uh, this thing was nobody's fault and it was, uh, you know, that it was just an accident and no one understood the risk involved. And, you know, I look at that and I go, this this that's just so not true. There's somebody at, at fault here, and uh, he was doing that strictly to get himself a job, and I, I, I take offense to that. So I think well, he, he he was pretty much like he was going there beforehand. I mean, I don't know if the, the ink was dry on the contract exactly, but no, no, no. Was was I mean, it, it was Owen involved as far as him opening the door. Job. Owen and McFoley kind of were involved in opening the door, right? Yeah, and I, I, I think I was aware of it, but the whole, the way even that was designed was that, uh, and I was clearly aware of it at the time, was that Vince offered Davey a job when he could get back on his feet. And of course, Davey was drying out in the hospital or whatever he was doing and recovering. And there was a lot of, you know, there was a lot of consideration at the time that he would never come back, you know, that it was, it was highly unlikely that he would be able to wrestle again. You know, I, and then I think Davey, you know, he said such such stupid things right away that, uh, again, that you can only be offended if you're in the family, but to talk about going back and winning a title in, in Owen's name was, you know, it's not about winning a, a fake wrestling title. It's, it's, you know, it's really, that's almost an insult to, to his memory that to think that, that, that you would concoct a storyline around something like that. Um, he clearly saw this, in my opinion, Davey clearly saw this as an opportunity to, um, take advantage of this horrible accident and turn it into a storyline or turn it into a, and I, I find that really bothers me and I, I've uh, again I think Davey should have stuck to the uh, you know just by doing what Jim Neidhart did and most of the members of the family have done but just not saying anything and don't defend Vince and you don't necessarily have to trash him at this time or anything like that but I mean you should just you know maybe just stay out of it until the smoke clears I mean the Kansas City Police Department never they, he was under investigation for at least three months for criminal negligence in this accident. That they had to really sift through it and find out if there was, uh, you know, what, you know, where where the negligence really lies, kind of thing. It was really a serious matter. And of course, Davy was on the on the news on Monday, going, "Hey, this is nobody's fault," and uh, you know, on to the next show, kind of thing. And it's like that, that's just not how I see it. And we have, I don't think we've actually ever talked about the subject, but uh, the Dynamite Kids book. I mean, I know you didn't like it, and what were your complaints with it? Um, you know, it's funny what people find that I that I didn't like about it. What I didn't like about it was I didn't think it captured what he was really like. And I know it was him that wrote it, but to be really honest, he came across like such a jerk in his book. And in fact, he actually was actually a much better guy than that. Because <laughs> uh, he, he did come across like that, which I thought was. I thought yeah, it I think was he really was the same guy he was then, to be really honest. And it's kind of a shame. I remember the guy. You know, we, right off the top, he was always a bully. Dynamite was always a bully, and he was always, um, 
you know, not the easiest guy to get along with sometimes. But at the same time, he was a very, um, he was a great guy, a great character. And uh, he, he had all these great qualities, and he literally, he was a great, what they call uh, enforcer in the dressing room kind of thing. He weeded out the guys with the bad attitudes. Um, everybody loved him. And when I read his book, he was he raved about, you know, and I don't have anything against anybody he raved about, but he put over more guys that he went out drinking with were great wrestlers rather than how they were judged for their work or how much they drew money, you know. Dan Spivey was an okay guy. But he raves about Dan Spivey in the book like he's uh, Ricky Steamboat or something. It's just not the same thing. I thought his I thought his his own analogies of himself and his I just thought it was a shame he's obviously not the same guy that I remember from a few years ago and he really missed I, I just don't think he he um he certainly didn't bring out his best qualities and I think if I was going to write a book about him I'd make you actually you could actually like him now one thing about the book. In, is that the book was probably, out of all the wrestling books, the most open when it comes to drug use of the wrestler, certainly in the 80s WWF. Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, there's there's other guys who've kind of said stuff, but, I mean, he went into detail, and I don't know if he exaggerated his own use. I think he probably was pretty straight with it, and it's, it was pretty shocking, I think, to people who weren't in the business who may have read it for the first time. Yeah, I... I... No, I mean, like in looking back on reading it, I, I didn't find anything he said in there was uh, uh, like unrealistic. There was, you know, the whatever he was taking steroids, and I think he was pretty honest about all that stuff. And I think he had no, you know, he didn't care who he offended by it. So, no, I think that was pretty accurate. The, the accurate, the pills and uh, all that stuff. You know, I hate to say he was one of the four, you know, the forerunners of that or the. You know, he was very, you know, I think a lot of his problems today resulted from him not knowing he was hurting himself as badly as he was. And that was a, seems to be a, you know, prerequisite for so many other wrestlers in this business as they get hooked on the painkillers and they, they take him to get in the ring, they take him to get out of the ring, they take him to work out, they take him to, you know, they got to take this to sleep, they got to do, you know, it's, it's an awful shame uh, that, that it happens and it's been happening for a long time. But I can think of all far too many wrestlers that I've met that were pretty clean cut when I first met them, and then you see them around that kind of environment for not even nine months. You know, a year later, you see them in their, you know, their, you know, because they're face down in their food, they someone's helping them up to the room. So, you know, it's awful. And I think British Bulldogs, both of them are, were guys that, uh, you know, you take a pain pill and you you just squat, you know, a million pounds kind of thing and. You know, they, they're, they're suffering for it today, the both of them. You know, one of the things about, about the book, especially towards the latter part of his career, that I, I found fascinating is, you know, after he had, especially after he had the big injury, and even a little bit before then, you know, you, can, you see this, the portrait of this guy who, you know, obviously in his prime was, was one of the great workers, um, who is trying to, mean, you know, he's, he's, in, he's in pain, and he's, as the years go by, in more and more pain to where he could hardly walk, and he's taken the drugs to stay in the business, to stay as high in the business until the point where literally, I mean, you know, he was in a wheelchair. I mean, he couldn't, I mean, the, the stories of him in the last year or two and how much pain he was in, um, I mean, I, you could tell, like, watching him, he wasn't the wrestler that he once was, but I don't think anyone realized just how you know how much he was doing just to get in the ring and and how you know really tragic the end of his career really was at such a young age. Yeah, I, I when I think of him, uh, I think of Dynamite. You know, I, I remember even when he worked for my father, he, he his knees were shot. Uh, you have to understand, Dynamite was clearly a kid that was on steroids for maybe the time he was about seventeen years old, uh, and, and, and heavily into them, or eighteen maybe. And I think Davey pointed to conceivably the same thing, but they got really young into steroids. They had great physiques when they were young, which had a lot to do with how they, they drew money. And, of course, they were stronger, faster. <laughs> they were they were really well-oiled machines when they were in their early 20s, both of them. And, uh, you know, they were – and they and they made money, and they and they did really well. But I often think now that, that uh, it's my own experience with steroids, uh, the limited use in contrast to them or comparison to them. But I think uh, 
that's steroids, especially at a young age, deteriorate your, your joints. Uh, they they give you a, a false security in the sense that you feel that you're indestructible all the time, and then combining that with painkillers. Um, the way Dynamite bounced around the ring and the way he worked and how hard he worked, and nobody worked harder than him, um, there's no doubt, like when I think of how many, his, he broke his hands, he broke his elbows, he broke his shoulders, his neck, his, his ears were cauliflowered, his knees were shot, his ankle, there's nothing left, there was nothing, including the two discs taken out of his back. Uh, nobody gave more to, than, to this business than he did, and unfortunately, I think, uh, including his two front teeth, he, he, um, he gave it all, and in the end, he became a very bitter, sour guy when he couldn't do it anymore, and it's just, it's just a shame that, uh, that he kind of missed his call. You know, and I, I feel a lot of uh, sympathy for him. What were your thoughts? Um, you know, in uh, mid-January, you know, everything was going down with you. You know, you know, you basically had to pull out of that pay-per-view as the champion uh, a couple of days before the pay-per-view, and then the whole thing with Benoit and Eddie Guerrero and everybody, Malenko, all going to WWF, you know, pretty much actually spurred in its own weird way from your injury and missing the pay-per-view, and they were scrambling for ideas and, it, one thing led to another. Russo ended up losing his position, which he just got back. And uh, Benoit and those guys, you know, Benoit, I guess, was your favorite opponent in the company, left. All all this is going on within, like, a one-week period. I mean, what was your feelings while, while this is all going down? Well, and I, you know, I was basically a catalyst to a lot of things, and I, I actually really, really regret it. I'm really sorry that it affected so many different people that way, and I think that, again, results. You can just look at, like, gee, somebody, somebody kicked me in the head, and look what happened. There's so many different things, it was like a domino, you know, all these different things happened, and I certainly was the catalyst, but all I'll say about any of that is that uh, I, I regret all of it, you know, I regret that I got hurt and it affected everyone like that, but I uh, I totally, uh, I can stand by whatever Chris Benoit's decision was, and Perry Saturn, who I both have high regard for, and, I, and even Dean Malenko, who I like, uh, I like all of them, and uh, I, I respect their their integrity. Uh, I don't know the circumstances. I never asked, but I know one thing. I can. I just couldn't find any problem or objection to anything Chris Benoit does. And if he had objections to, uh, I, you know, apparently it's Kevin Sullivan or whatever his problems were. I don't know what they were. And I, I don't need to know. I just know that I, I have a lot of regard for him and his integrity and his work. If he wasn't happy, and you know, it gives you some some uh, respect for even Bill Bush. He, you know, if they weren't happy, he let them leave, and he promised them that. He let them go. And, I just feel bad from from a selfish standpoint that I, you know, won't get a chance to work with him anymore. And you know, Perry Saturn, I, I wanted to work with him. The one match we had on TV was only about six minutes long. We were both kind of disappointed. You know, just those are both guys that I really look forward to working with, and I'm going to miss them. But you know, the, the WWF is, um, you know, it's, you know, I look at it strictly from an artistic standpoint. That I've always said to Chris that. Uh, you know, I like the bigger ranks. I like the real ropes of the WWF. You know, uh, you know, I'd be interested to see. See, he's about the one guy that I really look forward to still watching. I don't really care what comes in. Uh, if that, if that's a endorsement of the WWF, then fine. But I'll, I'll probably always watch Chris, no matter where he works. I just hope uh, they take care of him. They got the best worker in the business. I, uh, before before we go to the calls, I, I just wanted to get one one last question in. This was uh, about uh, two weeks ago. Uh, or whatever it was, the day that you were on uh, the Off the Record show, which I think airs April the 4th, um, and they played the clips of Vince McMahon uh, from Off the Record, I guess from about July. And, you know, I mean, I remember I remember listening to it when that thing was airing in Canada, and I had kind of heard what was said before it actually aired, and then listening to it, I got hot because I felt that, you know, he was trying to take this circumstance and twist it to... So almost like I mean, he was blaming you practically for his media problems, and I just thought that was really a you know to me it was a cheap shot because whatever problems you and he had had nothing to do with that accident at all. And a lot of people have tried to tie the two of them together as a way to perhaps you know justify his position or or complain about your position or something. And I don't know what were your thoughts like watching you know his him him saying that. Well, I thought it was a real low blow. To be honest, uh, you know, we met. I, I was very honest and open with him when I met him. I didn't pull any punches, and I, I don't regret anything I said to him. But at the same time, I I uh, saw this as a situation where you, you know, two 
you know, two very close friends at one time, somebody that I had high regard for and somebody I, well, I take that back, I had some regard for, somebody that, um, you know, I had, saw definitely I had some kind of a father figure in my life, and I thought he would always, you know, he says on that documentary so clearly, I'll always appreciate what you've done for me. And when I met him that day on the, uh, it was not a business meeting. Uh, it was uh, two old friends going to speak, and the, the tragedy was, uh, my brother, I think, called for that. It was like, what's who's going to worry about a silly old wrestling finish in <laughs> Montreal when something like this is, it just, overshadowed it so much that I felt that it was time to, I don't know, bury the hatchet over it, but at least there may be a chance to at least hear his side of it, or or uh, we never really spoke, and I, I, I was anxious to at least give him, give him the time to speak to me like he asked, and I was told specifically by the lawyers not to talk about the case, that was the only concern they had, just don't talk about it. Uh, and really there was no point in talking about it, and as soon as I sat down with him, I said, uh, you know, I'm sure you don't know any more than what the uh, the newspapers and the police have, have already, you know, sort of put out as what the, you know what, what they know is out there. And he goes, "No, I don't know any more than that." And I said, "Well, let's not even deal with it. We both know there's probably going to be a lawsuit." And from that point on, I was very honest and open with him. I talked about my feelings about them carrying on the show. Uh, you know, I brought up uh, you know how, how I uh, wanted to. To... Hello? Hello, yeah, I can hear you. Okay, well, I wanted to, uh, uh, I gotta, you gotta forgive me with the concussion. I get derailed, I get derailed. Yeah. Uh, anyway, we talked about the accident, the accident for, or not the accident, the, uh, we started talking about what they did to me in Survivor Series. And I just brought up, I said, why did you do to me what you did? You know, I just, the boys kind of wondered why. There was no necessity for it. There was no call for it. There was no reason for it. I had a whole month that I was going to be there. I'd agreed to do anything he wanted. And even in the end, uh, said, I don't even care. I'll put Sean over. That's, you know, but I just won't do it this weekend in Canada kind of thing. And you can clearly see how that would have hurt me in Canada. It would have really done. I think I've recognized in Canada now as a hero just for, for what I did do, the stand I made. And I think the documentary brought that out, which is some of it. It's only a blessing or a miracle that the documentary caught what they did. And it was never, when I flew home and they had the camera on me on the plane, I never, I was so pissed off because I thought no one would ever understand what I went through and what I gave up and what happened. I had no idea that that uh, taped interview would come out the way it did or that it would be, that they could somehow explain it into a documentary the way they did. So, I mean, I was really down about all that. And when I, I had a chance to clear the air with him and have just tell me, you know, why, um, he immediately told me he was, he apologized. He told me it was the biggest mistake he'd ever made. He regretted it from the day he did it. And he gave me that big song and dance and, and I told me I had to finish my career working for him. And I sat there on this park bench and I really sat there and I wondered, I, I said, you finally got the sort of apology that you always kind of felt you deserved. And I said, maybe this is sort of a closure or sort of thing. Like, maybe you can actually forget about it now. Or, And then I just sort of felt myself going, I wonder if it's sincere. And, and it was from there that I went to the next issue, of uh, which I was promised before I ever left that company, which was one of the most important things to me, was that I always wanted access to my archives and my film footage and my pictures and my, my history. I didn't want to lose that. That's why I, didn't, I never left. He knew that was, a, you know, you know, you just can't, I was, I felt I was an artist. It's like being a singer, uh, you know, writing all these songs and singing and all these hit songs. And then when you finish your career, they go, well, you can't sing any of those songs again. You can't play them back. You can't, you know, I, that was something that was, uh, you know, just was my lifeline. I gave everything I, uh, you know, I gave my heart and soul to professional wrestling, especially working at the WWF. And I was proud of everything I ever did. So I, you know, I, I asked him about that, and he promised me that then and there on the uh, bench that uh, that he would give me unlimited access to all my archives and all my footage. And I asked for Owen's family and his estate, and I remember directly saying to him that I I wanted this to be not it had nothing to do with any future, you know, whatever happened with this lawsuit. And I said I wanted this for services rendered in the past. Exactly those words. He promised me that there was no problem, and whatever I wanted was consider it done and by the time I checked with him that week his lawyers had told my lawyers that uh, that Vince McMahon did not recall that conversation ever taking place 
and I never did get it, and I just saw him. I said, he wasn't, had, didn't have any integrity for that right there on the day of the, before they put my my brother that he's directly responsible for, for allowing that to happen to him. Before they put him in the ground, he didn't have the decency to just stick to his word all with that. And even that, it's like, what could it cost him to, to give me that? It's, it's such a small thing to give me, and I think um, it tells you right there what kind of a person he is. Then for him to go on off the record, and, and I was very honest, he did have a, his his um, conduct with me in the end of the Survivor Series did greatly affect my uh, my situation at, situation at home. And, you know, it caused a lot of problems for me on the home front with my marriage and stuff like that, which has since sort of corrected itself. But he caused a lot of problems for me. He caused problems for Owen, and I was all based around or centered around his lack of integrity right from the very beginning. And for him to dismiss me on uh, off the record as a skeleton staring straight straight ahead with a, sort of a fixed glaze on my eye, my face and all that, uh, I thought it was really cold and uh, uh, a really insensitive thing to say uh, during that time, considering that I was kind enough to meet him. And he also implied on that show that I begged him for the meeting, which was also not true. It was an hour before the show, or before I met him, that he actually called and wanted me to meet him in his hotel room. It was Carlo DeMarco that said that he was fearful that I was going to kill him. And I said, well, for God's sake, why, why even meet him? Why even have a meeting if this guy is that uh, uh, pathetic that he thinks that I'm going to kill him? And, you know, just he, he's proved to be a very, when I think of Vince McMahon, I think he's a wrestling genius. I I think he's a creative guy of, um, you know, I just, I just can't believe that there was ever a necessity for him to be so dishonest and so cold-blooded, just a really a bad person. And, uh, I mean, the one question that I have is pretty much from the age of about 19, you've been on the road wrestling, um, either uh, for Stampede Wrestling, WWF Japan, constantly. Um, in the last year or so between the torn, uh, the, the torn groin and then the thing with Owen and then this thing, you, you know, except for the one break after uh, was it ninety six WrestleMania I think it was ninety six WrestleMania, um, you you really never had a big break. Now you've had a couple of breaks. I mean, away from wrestling, do you miss it? And now that you've had a chance to think about life away from wrestling, if that's so, is what happens? Give me ideas. Where, where, what, are you, what are your plans for after wrestling besides maybe writing a book? I don't know. I don't miss it. You know, I miss the city. Uh, and I miss some of the wrestlers, but I don't miss the actual working at all, which is a shame because I think I loved it. I, I don't, um, even when I think right now, like the only guy that really, uh, other than some of the old guys, like, you know, funny, uh, and I ragged on so many of these guys before, but I would still would like to work with Hogan, you know, I'd still like to work with Flair. Because Flair's, I wrestled Flair somewhere, I think it was Lincoln, Nebraska, a few, you know, a little while back. Um, it was great, I, you know. I really, it was fun working with him. It was like so. I, I, I saw certain situations where it was fun. Um, I think that was just before I screwed everybody, <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. turned heel kind of thing. So I suppose I was having more fun as a baby face. Um, I could have fun as a heel, but I, uh, I don't know. So I, I could have fun still wrestling. I don't know, but if I got out of wrestling, uh, I haven't missed. I haven't missed working with. Uh, some of the green guys, you know, uh, let me put it this way, even working with Bill Goldberg was a lot like, you know, uh, I felt like that uh, Samsonite luggage commercial with the gorilla beating that suitcase up. Yeah. You know, I felt like the suitcase. And, you know, I'm, and there's no way around that. Bill's just, you know, he's just a powerful, explosive guy that when he power slams you or does some of those moves on you, it's, if you think it hurts or it doesn't, you know, if it's it's solid, it, it is. If this hurt, it does hurt. It is solid. And, you know, I, I literally finished that match in Starcade with uh, Bill. I crawled back to my room and passed out with all my clothes on. It was it was a it was a very physical uh, match. Maybe I'm maybe I'm just getting too too worn out. But I also look at how I work still at my age. I still go hard. I still wrestle as physical and solid as just about everyone else. I haven't really slowed down that much, but uh, I don't know, man. You know, and, and, and so that makes you you really do consider moving on past wrestling. And, you know, I wouldn't mind getting into film, getting behind the camera, and losing wrestling, and never having, you know, just change tracks. And you know, I'll be grateful for everything I did in wrestling. And, and uh, you know, it seems like at least a 
teachings of parent right now that my my real true archives, my best matches, and the great moments of my career will be lost in a vault somewhere in Connecticut. You know, if you've got some old tapes of it, you should treasure them because they're, you know, I think, especially the young guys today, I think they, they maybe should look back and, you know, watch some of the matches I had with Shawn Michaels in it for an hour or Stone Cold, and, you know, all kinds of different guys. I had some great stories. And maybe I can take that same imagination that I have in, from wrestling and, and create stories on a different level, on a different stage, a different way. And I think that I can, you know, I can bring that out. And I thought a lot about, uh, uh, getting behind a camera, or, you know, making some low-budgeted uh, films, you know, that necessarily don't include me as an actor, but are more bent on, uh, you know, bringing out maybe uh, I could get some kind of funding, just say here up here in Canada nationally for for certain projects, and I think well connected with the industry up here. So it's just that something I would maybe be able to put my heart into. I'd like to do something intelligent, you know. I, I I've I had to think about politics by it, so I had an off, off the cuff mark at an autograph session here in Calgary, uh, and I made the sort of comment. They asked me about politics, and I, I didn't really have an answer, and I just said never say never. And it took off as a national story up here, and they, they, you know, wanted to know if I really considered politics. You know, I, I don't rule it out. Only a sense that you know, you just never know. I don't think Jesse planned on getting into politics either when he got out of wrestling. You know, sometimes you your flair for being in front of the camera, the fact that you maybe have principles and maybe you start to realize that you're not, you know, that you're not an idiot and you have some uh, ability to say what you want to say and people get behind you. You just never know with politics, but I, I, don't, I don't see that as being my my uh, game either. I think if I have had the <laughs> problems with wrestling, it would only be magnified by the, the real political you know, of the, the politics. So I, I don't see that, but... I don't know. I, I, I see it wide open, and I think I see maybe if, if if I can't wrestle again, this concussion doesn't improve, and it turns out that uh, you know, I have to consider a different kind of livelihood. Um, I, I'd probably just take a little time to, like you said, I have never really been home in 22 years. It's been quite an adjustment already dealing with uh, being home and you know just the the situation that I'm in. It's the, I go through all kinds of different phases from having to deal with my my family and. Uh, you know, just having uh, you know, never been home here in the city. It's a, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a whole new experience. Let's go to the phone calls, Trent. I want to thank you for uh, waiting for so long. Uh, you're first up with Brett. No, no trouble. It's an outstanding show. Probably your best one ever, Dave. Oh, thank um, you. Well, thank Brett then. Well, yeah, just, I just, I'm just loving listening to it. Uh, two quick questions for Brett. I know you, you're short on time. Uh, firstly, is what are your what were your uh, favorite programs or favorite people to work with over the years? My favorite workers. I didn't hear the question. Like the favorite favorite angles and, and workers, yeah. Um, well, for, for sure, the two best things I did the whole time I've been in the WCW, uh, which I think is what you're kind of getting at, is uh, I loved the thing I did in Toronto with uh, Goldberg with the, 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 the steel plate. Uh, it was so hard to pull it off. There was a lot of. Um, you know, stuff going on behind the scenes, and I don't think anybody seemed to understand. Again, I think it was a it was an excellent story, and it was a great little uh, the closest I've ever come to any kind of a real. You know, I, I blew everyone's mind kind of thing with that. I thought it was great. I loved it. When I watch it back, even now, I go, "That was the only really great thing I ever did for the whole time I was in that company." It was such a, a pleasant surprise, and you know, I was such a heel everywhere else. And I go to Canada, and I got that reaction again. I was so cheered. It was just, it was such a good. Uh, they should have taken off and become a big thing, and uh, they, you know, I still never felt they quite uh, capitalized on that the way they did. And unfortunately, my brother's accident didn't help that either. But um, that was for me a, a great moment. If I could go back and live that, that was one of them. And uh, the other one, I always will be. Maybe I think it's maybe my single greatest moment in my career would be the one I had with Chris Benoit in Kansas City. Uh, just from a personal standpoint, was uh, I think it was the last great wrestling match of the. Of, of certainly of the year anyway, or the century or whatever, but like just finishing it before the year 2000, all that was, was special. But, uh, yeah, no, that, I, that I, style, I, sure. Yeah, I don't think you, like, they're not wrestling like that anymore, and we, it was so much fun working with him. And, uh, if anything, I felt that uh, he carried me a little bit. You know, I 
I wished I could have even done more for her. I wanted to give so much, but I've been off, and it was tough. And, you know, you just, I, and I'm not, uh, I, I thought I did really, really well, and it was a really great match. But he's just such a great wrestler that uh, I wanted to, if I could have wrestled him all night, I would have been. But all in all, I thought uh, that was, those are the two highlights of my WCW career, probably that, and the, probably the pay-per-view where I won the title. And also, also as far as uh, I think, I think you also meant as far as like your favorite angles and stuff in WWF as well. Oh, uh, my favorite angles of all time. Uh, yeah. Well, I, I always loved the uh, the whole thing with Austin, and I love the thing. You know, the saddest thing about the whole thing with Shawn Michaels was that Shawn was very much aware of where the storyline was going when we when we we ended that thing in Anaheim where he won the hour match. Uh, everything was on schedule. Like I said, I, I didn't know when I was coming back or, or even if with my Hollywood rest, uh, my acting career taken off, which was sort of hopeful at that time. It was the groundwork was laid where I didn't shake his hand at the end of the match. I was going to come back and always have a chip on my shoulder about him. And I was going to cut these kind of little bit shoot interviews on him. And he was always going to, the whole thing was, was built and it was supposed to happen that way. He was supposed to drop the title to me. He was supposed to come back and work with me in another match where I drop it back. Uh, when I look at that story and that angle and the way that whole thing would have built, and you can obviously see that I was right because there was such a tension in our interviews that if we'd just been smart enough to work it, and I was working. I was. I thought we were right on target. And uh, Of course, uh, poor Sean, and then he started to... You know, work. Get, it got, he got worked into a shoot, and unfortunately, he was he marked out. And he's always referred to me as being the, the mark, but it's a shame because we would have done big business, and it was all designed to, to make him. But uh, that and the, the match that I had with Steve Austin, the whole storyline. Uh, I've never felt that I made Steve Austin or anything like that. Steve would have made it regardless of who he worked with, and I don't have any doubts about that. Steve was a great guy to work with. He's one of my favorite guys I ever worked with. I still. Uh, really have a lot of respect and admiration for him, and I, I consider him a good friend of mine. Uh, but the match itself, um, the one we had at WrestleMania was, you know, basically I remember talking to him before the match and going, basically we're going to switch places in a few minutes. I'm going to be the, and it was all very sudden. You know, it was done on us right, kind of right then and there, and that's where the promotion was heading, and it was like, we're switching places. I'm going to be the top heel, and you're going to be the top baby face. And let's look at it from that perspective. And, you know, I, I think Steve and me sat down and kind of uh, put that match together in very limited time, but uh, very unselfishly. If anything, he was really considerate uh, of, you know, and I don't know, the whole thing with the, the match itself, and the, that was one of the greatest matches of them all. And I, I'm really proud to have uh, had anything to do with uh, Steve's success after that. One guy, you know, that reminds me of something is um, very, very early in, in Rock's career, you wrote something, you were still in the WWF, and you said you wrote something about, you know, looking forward to the day that you pass the torch to him, and I mean, he probably had only been in the business for maybe a year, a couple months, it was very early in his career, and while everyone saw potential in him, the idea that he would be the guy to carry the company was in, in, no, in no one's mind, and the first or second time I ever thought about it was reading it reading what you said about him and what are your thoughts of him now that he's become such an unbelievable star well I, I same thing I I'm glad I had anything to do with it I give him I think pretty good advice all the time and in particular Shawn Michaels I uh, really uh, was really hard on him and tried to uh, tried to ruin him really and was uh, jealous as hell of him and criticized him openly and brought you know whatever and tearing him to shreds in the dressing room or some real small petty thing that happened in a match. Um, he had great resolve in the sense that he, you know, I told him, I said, don't pay attention to a lot of the criticism you're getting is strictly jealousy. These guys are really jealous of you. They see the potential in you, or, you know, and he overcame all those things. And he was a great athlete. Right from the beginning, you could tell he had uh, just been a third-generation wrestler, and he's a legitimate third-generation gener wrestler in a sense. He really grew up in the business, much the same as I did or Kurt Henning. Or, you know, he followed it. He understood it. His dad probably had wrestlers uh, in direct contact with him all the time. Uh, I don't think he could ever escape it. And, uh, when you have it around you like that, you, you really absorb it in whether you like it or not. And, uh, he, you know, he's, you know, I'm really... I think he's clearly the guy that's going to be the main star in wrestling for a long time. And all I'll say about him is I, it's my, you know, 
understand it from all the time I've ever met him, that he's always been a leader in the dressing room. He's always been a team guy. He's always been, uh, uh, you know, he's a, he's a great guy. And same thing, I would, I, I've been really proud of him. I, when I met him last year before my brother's accident here in Calgary, I told him I was really proud of him. And I told Steve Austin the same thing. Uh, I don't have any um, hard feelings for uh, really any of the wrestlers in the company. And, I, and it should be understood very clearly that uh, it's been circulated that I'm trying to, which has nothing to do with this lawsuit. And, uh, and I just don't, that uh, this lawsuit will bankrupt this company. And they're trying to almost put the guilt on, on uh, the lawsuit kind of thing. There's no way that this lawsuit would ever bankrupt the WWF. And they try to sort of throw fear into the, the wrestlers and sort of make out that uh, that I have such an animosity and hatred for the company and I want to see everybody ruined. But I don't have any of those sentiments. I, I still care about the company. And there was a lot of really great people that worked there in the company. And it's just a damn shame that someone as smart as Vince McMahon is too stupid to have integrity sometimes when it really doesn't make any difference whatsoever. He's always had an opportunity to be a better guy. Uh, but the actual company, I, I'm I'm proud of uh, how I wrestle. I, I, there's uh, all kinds of guys like Tess that, that, that I started out, you know, Shamrock, and a lot of guys that are still affiliated with that company. And even now, Benoit, I, I I don't have any problems with anybody working for anybody in that company. It's just that it's not, that's not what my problem is. What are your thoughts as far as, you know, Canada, you know, especially Toronto area, they've really produced a lot of the young talent that's, uh, you know, spearheaded uh, the WWF's future, really. Yeah, I don't know. It's Canada's always been a sort of a hotbed for wrestling. I don't know. Toronto, the eastern part of the country, especially right now. I don't know. It's I don't know. Maybe it's the pride of knowing that Canadians have done well in it. Before, you know, even like Pat Patterson, for example, is Canadian. I don't know if anybody ever had a better mind for wrestling finishes than he did. Uh, some of the really great minds in wrestling might have been uh, might have been Canadian. I I don't know. It's it's a it's an interesting way to look at it. I thought, I've always found a remarkable difference between uh, Canada's wrestlers are always a little tighter, a little more solid, a little more. Um, uh, polite, a little more shy. Like uh, there seems to be always be like guys like Benoit. I was a very uh, reclusive kind of guy, I think, for a long time. They're always more humble, things like that. And tennis, like Tennessee, for example, a lot of the Southern wrestlers are real. Uh, you know, and, and it seems almost inbred in them. They can all cut the interviews all day long. They're they're blessed with the sort of the being able to to uh, sell themselves better than Canadian wrestlers. But I, I don't think there's you know, the Canadians always have had, and this is from coast to coast, have always been really solid, credible wrestlers more often than not. And sadly, in the most, a lot of cases, were never considered, um, you know, gifted in front of the microphone enough to make it. And a lot of them didn't make it in the States, uh, but they were great wrestlers. So the style's always been prevalent up here. Maybe um, that the... American wrestling hero was always Hogan, who was more of a showmanship kind of interview guy. And, you know, you and Owen were probably the biggest Canadian stars. So these guys like, you know, Christian and Edge, when they looked at like a, a national wrestling superstar, you know, it was guys who were really good technical wrestlers. So that's kind of like maybe where their mindset started, you know, it was with the technical wrestling as opposed to their mindset starting, you know, like uh, by, you know, cutting promos or, you know, just going to the gym and, Lifting weights, but not practicing moves. I guess I don't know. Yeah, you know, I, I you know, you, there's a certain work ethic anyway. Wrestling, you you only learn what's in front of you, kind of thing, really. So it's like what you're watching, which really for the last quite a few years, ten years, it's probably most people have watched WWF. I mean, that's that's I think it's pretty clear. They were always been the strongest wrestling company. Uh, for for the longest time anyway, rather than the WCW who were on top for a limited time. But I think the style, wrestling style, and I think Vince was, you know, in the beginning was always very, I always thought that like Vince McMahon was like this wrestling fan inside. Like he always seemed to, in my case as an example, he used to tell me, I don't want to know what you're doing, like other than the finish and the, uh, you know, knowing where the story is kind of going. And the match itself was my responsibility, almost from the time I worked with him. But in particular, when I was champion, it was like, I don't want to know what you're doing. Like Wembley, he didn't want to know what the finish was. He told me he wanted to watch it and see it. And I had that luxury for the whole time I worked in the, 
the WWF. They really let me paint the picture, tell the story, and and I I don't think I did it that anybody did it better. And I, you know, in, in looking at these Canadian wrestlers, they, you know, they had to have watched me, and they, and I'm sure that a lot of them watched. You know, I know Jericho, for example, very much so watched uh, Owen. And um, somehow, if we inspired them to be better wrestlers, which I think we did, and I think we also carried that on the other side of the wall in the sense that in the dressing room, we were, you know, we I never found that we were complainers. We always, um, you know, we always went out there and gave a good match and, you know, came back and we had a pretty good time, you know, and made the best of the circumstance all the time, whether it was a long trip or bad weather or whatever. I think we always made the best of it. And I think we, in looking at a lot of the Canadian wrestlers, and Ben was a great example. You know, he's just a guy that never complains, always goes up there and gives 100%. Uh, and they, they work so hard, and I think a lot of them, like in Bush, were on the same level. And this is goes to even uh, test, you know, and Val Venus, who I didn't train with or work with, but I've met him. And he seems a really um, dedicated guy that's uh, well-spoken and, and probably respected in, in the business, and he's only been in it a short time. Let's go to Ricardo in New York. Ricardo, you're next up with Brett. Yes, hi, uh, Dave. Hi, Brett. Um, hi. Um, Brett, uh, as long as you live, and, as long, and it doesn't matter where you end your career, um, you'll always be seen as a WWF superstar and perhaps the, the best uh, WWF wrestler in the 90s and, and maybe ever. Uh, is, does that, well, obviously, I guess that doesn't, that doesn't bother you, right? Uh, Despite the problems you had with with Vince McMahon and the WWF, uh, your heritage uh, will still live in the WWF. And regardless, I mean, it doesn't matter if you don't have, you know, that that the, the WWF is trying to to um, pretty much erase whatever you did in the past. Uh, could you please tell me what were your thoughts when uh, in that pay per view you had to lose the belt? To uh, Yokozuna, so Hogan could win it back from from Yokozuna from him. What would, what what happened backstage? Can you tell us something about that? Well, I never. Um, I was, you know, it's funny this the things that happened. I was always very frustrated with the match, um, in the sense that if you watch the match, it was it was a match that had two two very powerful like had, a, had two, it was basically two matches combined together. And in that match, um, Yokozuna, um, he, I think basically he got so tired or fatigued that he, uh, the wrestling term has blown up, that he cut out the entire second part of the match kind of thing. We just ended up going into the finish. So I was really upset after the match, only from an artistic standpoint, that he took it upon himself to eliminate the best part of the uh, match for me. Uh, and and I didn't get to sort of tell that story that I wanted. So it's like basically being a movie director doing a live show or something, and, and, and we ended up with a half the show that we wanted. But so that, that I was very angry. I remember I punched a wall and almost uh, I cut my hand. I think on something in the back. That was so. If it was ever interpreted that I was angry about the match, that was the reason why. Uh, as for the actual finish and being told, which I didn't find out till I think that morning, that I was losing the, the title, uh, I really took it upon myself the day I won the title because I'm one of the only guys I think that ever just walked in one day and they said you're going to be the champion tonight, and that was quite a shock to me. I never saw it coming. I didn't have a chance to to uh, stab my way to the top. I just found myself in it kind of thing, and a lot of guys didn't have a chance to stab me before I got to the top. It just happened, and, and I promised Vince McMahon that day, and much the same promise I made to him the, every time I ever worked for him, uh, that I just wanted him to know that uh, I would never have a problem losing it to anybody, anytime, anywhere, and uh, I didn't care what the circumstances were. I didn't care what the... And I was a privileged and flattered that he saw that enough in me to put the title on me in the first place so I didn't have a problem with it when I did he told me not to worry about Hogan that Hogan was only going to do a tag team thing with uh, DiBiase and those guys uh, I think at the time and he was coming back to sort of push a movie and that was it and I was not prepared for it I walked in and all of a sudden everything was changed and uh, I was a little hurt by it and felt that I hadn't been given enough time. I think every champion that loses the belt that first time, like Kevin Nash, even 
they go on and on at different times that have held it and realize they didn't carry it. Or, uh, and you have a tendency to put the blame on yourself that, uh, you know, you didn't carry it well enough. And then you blame, like, you know, they didn't give me enough of a chance. They didn't. And I think all those things were true and probably for everyone else. You know, they sometimes, uh, uh, you know, expecting it. it. It's a blow. Like, when I lost that title, it, it hurt. Like, I... I Lost my position, which is another. Here's a here's another lie of Vince McMahon's that came out at the time. Was uh, I remember in that meeting? I said because I'd never flown first class in those days. They used to fly the world champion first class, and uh, you know it was the first time I'd ever been flying first class, and it was kind of that was a big luxury for me at the time. And I remember when he, you know, let me know that uh, that it, that they were going to do this other finish and Hogan was going to be the champion. I just said, I said, does that mean I'm going to lose my first class? And he said, he laughed and said he would never, that I would never do that to me and that uh, as long as this company could afford it, uh, I would be flying first class forever. And I said, well, I appreciate that. And I really didn't have any problem with it until I never flew first class again. <laughs> you know. Uh, until I won it again, and I remember when I won the belt the second time, I I said, "So does this mean?" Uh, I remember when he asked me to drop it the second time. I said, "You're going to steal my, or not steal, but take my first class away from me again." And it was a, you know, we all had a good laugh over it. But I certainly never forgot that he he openly lied to me then. So, but I, you know, I took it all with a grain of salt. I I, I was at the, at that time. I kind of got a little. You know, I suppose a, a tendency to get a little bitter, and uh, at that, a little later on after that, uh, like months later, when I realized that actually, you know, I was doing a pretty good job as champion, and I don't know why they had to pull the rug out from underneath me. And, you know, I said I think a lot of wrestlers experience the same kind of withdrawal symptoms. You know, let's go to uh, Scott in Philadelphia. Scott, you're up with Brett. Yeah, hi, Brett. This is Scott Goldstein, Philadelphia. Um, uh, first of all, I'd like to wish you a complete and successful uh, recovery from your concussion. I uh, hope, hope everything uh, improves for you. Um, second of all, uh, you wrote a col column in The Sun on the 7th of January, and uh, I wrote a response to that. I sent it to you by email in a couple different ways, and I posted it on, uh, actually on the Wrestling Observer uh, website. Um, and really the issue that, I guess at the time, it just sort of struck me because I was very concerned about the use of baseball bats and how I saw it as unnecessary and a dangerous thing to portray constantly on wrestling. And some of what you addressed in your January 7th uh, column sort of stimulated me to write to you and to sort of ask you whether you felt that uh, some of what you had done in, in portraying uh, using a baseball bat in the ring constantly, et cetera, whether you found that uh, something that you regret doing or hypocritical to some of the statements that you made in the uh, January 7th column that you wrote. Well, a little bit, only from a, you know, you know, myself, like I, I like wrestling for wrestling kind of thing. Uh, I, but I don't dictate policy in wrestling, and I was this moral crusader. I think maybe a little too much, and it's like, oh, it's like I'm sort of tired of being the guy that complains about whether the direction wrestling's going. And then, you know, after a while, it's like you know, people are gonna watch whatever they're gonna watch. I'm tired. I'm tired of. You know, I made my opinion clear, and I think it's a lost art. And it's an art. You know that they better start respecting a little bit more. They won't have an art in wrestling. It's there's no art to to using the bat and stuff like that all the time to the point that it's become something that has changed drastically and maybe they should look at uh, danger pay and all that because it's not the same thing. But as far as my own, myself, again, I, I just, you know, I get paid to do a job. I reasoned that I wanted to go back um, and wrestle. You know, I, I understood clearly and I hope that most people did that it's a show now and it's like a soap opera and, you know, I had, for the first time had a had a big role in the show, and I, I didn't really want to be a heel, but I thought, well, if I can be a heel and, and uh, you know, be able to allow people to let out their aggressions on me as a heel, and make, you know, in, in the, under the idea that it is a show, and this is I'm just playing the role of a character now, and clearly state that. Uh, so I kind of was torn between two things, but I tried to just do as I was told, quit dragging my feet bitching all the time about, you know, the content and this and that. And just look at it as a situation is like, you know, can my kids turn on the TV, you know, and they haven't or really don't watch it much anymore. But if they did, and I was on TV, could they watch me? And I, I didn't have any problem with anything I did. I really didn't like the direction that my story, my character went. Sometimes I thought he, um, you know, it, it kind of, yeah, I just kind of took myself out of it, I guess. You know, like even that last day I worked in, uh, 
Erie, Pennsylvania, uh, and I had a really, really bad concussion. I could barely talk, uh, but I didn't know it. But uh, that's where they had me out this throughout the show. Kind of, I did a, actually a pretty good interview where uh, you know I, I turned baby face that night and I saw a lot of the old grandmas clapping and kids were really excited. I knew it was going to be a swerve at the end of the show where we all double crossed Terry Funk and all that kind of stuff, and I, you know, I kind of regretted it, and I, I was like, "Geez, I'm going to be a real, you know, real jerk in a couple of minutes, kind of thing." And you know, and I said, "You know what? It's, it's wrestling. It's a show. I'm doing what my part is, and uh, uh, I'll put safety as a priority and nothing else. And not worry about the, you know, if it hurts someone's feelings or something. Maybe they shouldn't watch wrestling anymore." And, you know, I don't have a lot of control over that. Maybe, you know, I don't know. I, I'm. It's a. It's, it's a very tough thing to be torn and uh, in, in trying to change things. And you know, like the match I had with Chris Benoit as an example. People just don't want to pay to see wrestling like that over and over and over and over anymore. And that's a shame because that's what I loved about it the most. But I'm apparently in a minority, and most people would rather watch somebody drive a truck into the side of a car or something. And, which I I just scratch my head. It's, like I said, it's become something that uh, is constantly changing. And what it is or where it goes from here, I'm not sure. Well, we are completely out of time. I want to mention that Bret Hart's book, uh, Bret Hart, The Best There Is, The Best There Was, The Best There Ever Will Be by Bret Hart and Perry Lefko is at all the bookstores. It's uh, got photos of uh, Bret Hart's career in uh, WWF, WCW, title history, a lot of family pictures and things like this. And I want to wish you, uh, I want to wish you like a speedy recovery and just get everything back together. I hope you know, like the headaches and everything go away. And if you can come back, that that's great. And if you, if you know, you, if whatever else, I just want to wish you the best of luck and hope that uh, you know you can uh, write like the encyclopedia of wrestling because I know you've got more notes than everybody. Well, Dave, I'll just say this much that if I ever. You know, if I reach that decision where, uh, you know, the end is near and I'm going to have to make that decision, I know you'll be the first one to know whether I ever like it or not. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, no, I'd be, I'd be happy to, uh, you know, I care a lot about the American fans and my fans in general everywhere. And uh, you're the most uh, recognized, uh, legitimate, uh, you know, reliable source in wrestling. And I'd be honored to be able to call you and let you be the first one to know if, uh, when, if and when my career is over or when it's starting back. And, uh, and until then, we'll talk. Okay. I want to thank you very much for doing the show. And I want to remind everyone that uh, tomorrow we'll be talking about Raw and Nitro. Wednesday, we've got uh, Larry Matisic from St. Louis. Thursday, Jim Cornette. Friday, Chris Cruz. Monday, Taz. And uh, we'll be back 6 p.m. tomorrow with uh, Brian 